Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we trust you and we long to know you better. Please, will you give us a humility of spirit and a softness of heart as you speak to us now through your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had that experience where you're reading something and then you get to the bottom of the page, turn it over, and it dawns on you that you have no idea what you just read? You've looked at each word in turn. They all make sense to you. There's no confusion. And yet, for some reason, you didn't string those words together at all. They left no meaningful impression on your mind whatsoever. Or maybe this one's more familiar. Uh, someone that you live with is telling you about their day, and you love them. So, of course, you're, you're listening to them, aren't you? And then there's an awkward pause, and it's apparent that they've asked you a question. And only then does it dawn on you that while you heard every word, um, nothing is confusing or complicated. Each one made sense as an individual burst of sound. You had no idea what was being said. You just didn't string those words together at all. You heard, but you weren't listening. In Mark chapter 4, we are relentlessly reminded of the importance of listening to God. In fact, you might remember last time we were in Mark's gospel, two weeks ago, uh, we were looking at the parable of the four soils. And while it's certainly true that um, four different things are going on with the soils, often beneath the surface, um, there are only two eventual outcomes, fruitlessness or fruitfulness. There are all kinds of reasons for being fruitless, uh, all kinds of causes for the rejection of Christ, uh, distractions and difficulties, wealth and worries, sadnesses and sicknesses. Uh, there are a million different things that can keep you from Christ, a million different things going on um, under the surface, but ultimately only two outcomes. The Bible says what it comes down to is how you hear. Think of this. In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking about his relationship with his people, and this is how he describes it. He says, I am the good shepherd, and my sheep listen to my voice. That is how Jesus describes the relationship between him as shepherd and us as sheep. Verse 27 of John chapter 10, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. I was reading earlier in the week about how uh, Middle Eastern shepherds would, also, uh, would often keep their various flocks in the, the same pen um, to keep them safe overnight. And the shepherds would all guard that one pen. Um, which is better than trying to guard 14 different sheep pens across the hills from a pack of wolves or uh, the, the like. Now, the interesting thing is, in the morning, um, how would they divide the, the flocks among the shepherds? Well, the shepherds would separate from each other and each start calling their sheep. And get this, the sheep would separate themselves by listening to their own master's voice. How do you know which sheep belong to a particular shepherd? Simply that they listen to his voice and follow him. That is exactly what is being said in Mark chapter 4. Being a follower of Jesus is ultimately all about listening to him. The word listen or hear is the Greek word akuo. It occurs 14 times in this one chapter alone. Um, most interestingly, perhaps, look at the very last verse of Mark chapter 4. Even the wind and the waves... Akuo him. What does your translation say? Obey him. Which tells you what? That listening and obeying go hand in hand. In fact, if you don't obey, you weren't really listening. You were taking on sound, but you weren't listening. You were hearing noise, but you weren't listening. These two things are intrinsically linked. They are deeply intertwined. Mark chapter 4, verse 20, as we saw last time, some people are like seed sown on good soil. What is the distinguishing mark of good soil? They hear the word, which, of course, means more than just listening. They receive it. They rightly respond to it. They actively obey it. They hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. 
So the, the three parables we're looking at this morning, it may seem like they're about gardening or lighting even, but actually they're all about hearing. They all serve to support the same central idea that we looked at two weeks ago, and that is rightly responding to the word of God and the difference it makes when we do. And so, uh, look at this first parable then, verse 21. Jesus said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, that same theme again, let them hear. Now, you might be thinking, um, does this really warrant a story being told? I mean, isn't this just blisteringly obvious? Isn't it just blatantly true? Um, it, on the surface, it seems like this pr- parable is solving a problem that nobody has. We all know how to use a lamp. And we all know what it's for. Nobody is going around putting a lamp under a bowl and wondering why it's not working, and why it's ineffective. Well, uh, maybe that's not quite the case. Maybe there's more going on uh, in Mark's gospel than we might realize. What have we seen so far in Mark's gospel? Well, so far in Mark's gospel, there's been a good deal of secrecy and mystery around the true identity of this man, Jesus. The the demons have correctly identified him. I know who you are, son of the most high God. And Jesus has, has silenced them. Even people who have seen part of his power, people who have glimpsed something of his glory, have been hushed up by Jesus. And so the question is, why? Why all the silencing? Why all the secrecy so far? Doesn't it seem like Jesus is putting a bowl over the light, keeping it hidden? Well, you might remember from the very famous story of the leper, there are practical reasons why, at the start of his ministry, Jesus was telling people uh, not to tell others about what he had done for them. As a result of the leper's um, loose lips uh, blabbing about it all over town, Jesus was unable to enter um, densely populated areas to continue his ministry. He had to uh, do his ministry in the remote, isolated places for fear of being mobbed by the crowds. He did not want his true identity or the fullness of his true identity to be revealed too soon. He had work to do. Uh, One of the the kind of um, motifs in the Gospels, one of the regular refrains is that Jesus' time had not yet come. His time had not yet come. There was an appropriate time for the glory of God to be revealed in Christ Jesus, but that day is not today in Mark chapter 4. That day has not yet come. Now, that might sound strange to us, but in fact, we do the same thing all the time. Uh, We've just had Mother's Day um, last week, and in our household, our little boy, Archer, uh, very carefully crafted a beautiful card for his mum. And when Josie came home uh, one afternoon, this was before the shutdown, uh, he ran up to Josie um, full of joy, without prompting, with great delight, told her, there's nothing hidden under the sink. Uh, He doesn't know how to keep a secret, but he does know that there's an appropriate time to reveal this big surprise. There is a, like a moment of maximum impact for the big reveal, but it is not yet. Therefore, um, there's nothing hidden under the sink. And so for the disciples living in these days, when Jesus is doing the most incredible things and telling people to be quiet about them, they may have genuine questions about the nature of his ministry. Couple that with the fact that at this time in the world, mystery religions were very popular. Um, We even have a little bit of this today, don't we? Uh, You have to join the club to find out what the club is actually about. You have to give a certain amount of money or get to a certain level before special knowledge can be revealed to you. Um, That is hiding the light, as it were, under a bowl or behind a paywall. That is not and has never been what Christianity is about. In fact, in Acts chapter 26, Paul is on trial for proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And in his trial, in the defense, uh, he does the very thing that got him in trouble in the first place. That is, he preaches the good news when he is on trial. This is what he says in Acts chapter 26. On trial for his life, he says, I'm not saying anything beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer 
as the first to rise from the dead, he would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Now, listen to this. See how this ties in with what we've been thinking about in Mark's gospel. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice. Why? Because it was not done in a corner. It was not private or partitioned off. It wasn't secret or secluded. This was public. This was open. This has been made known to all. The Christian gospel was always intended to be, as we just read, light. Light for the blessing and benefit of all people. And so Jesus tells us, make no mistake, the lamp is supposed to go on the lampstand. The rays are supposed to reach far and wide. All nations will be blessed through this. Since the very beginning, this has been God's eternal purpose and plan, that his people in general and his son in particular would be a blessing to all people on the planet. Isaiah 49 verse 6, I will make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the very ends of the earth. What is Jesus saying in Mark chapter 4? He is looking his disciples in the face and telling them, this is it. The light has come into the world. I have no intention of hiding under the bed or being buried under a bowl. All people will see my glory and it is your job to be the lampstand. For whatever is hidden, verse 22, for whatever is hidden, which is to say what is now hidden for a time is meant to be disclosed. What is now concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. The only thing keeping people from knowing the light, having the light, walking in the light, experiencing the light, beholding the beauty and experiencing the joy and receiving the blessings of knowing the Son of God, the light of the world, the only thing preventing people from coming to him is how they hear, how they respond to his revelation. There is no secret beyond that. There is no hurdle or no barrier beyond that. The gospel, the seed, is sown far and wide. The light is shone far and wide. If you have ears to hear, then hear. If you have a heart that is ready to receive the good news, then receive it. Nothing is holding you back. No one is stopping you. Nothing is preventing you from making Christ your king. In this conversation, Jesus here is shifting his disciples from thinking of themselves purely as soil to thinking of themselves as sowers. Do you see that? Now, it's certainly true that every single one of us in this church ought to be, intends to be, wants to be, and by the grace of God, will be good soil, ready to receive the word of truth. But there's a, a subtle shift in responsibility here. I wonder if you noticed that. You and I, we are not to be just soil. We are sowers too. This word is designed to be shared. The seed must not be stored away and kept to ourselves. The seed must be sown. In the same way, the light must be shone. It's not to be kept secret or hidden away or secluded or enjoyed only by a select you. The seed must be sown and the light must be shone, and we, as Christians, have a part to play in that. Jesus expands on that idea in Matthew chapter 5. He says to his followers, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl, but instead they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others. Why? That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, the gospel is the exact opposite of being a secret. Everything you do, in speech or in deed, ought to draw people's attention to the God that you love 
and serve. The seed is meant to be sown. The light is meant to be shone. That is its very purpose. And to do anything less with what you have received yourself is a tragedy. Now immediately, when the, the attention gets turned to you and you become not the soil but the sower, or rather not just the soil but also the sower, um, when you become not just the one following the light but actually the one holding the light, there's a certain nervousness or trepidation that comes with that responsibility. Don't you think? Suddenly Jesus has turned the tables and you and I have got some work to do, haven't we? When it comes to the seed, when it comes to the light, when it comes to the life-changing, sin-crushing, soul-saving good news of the gospel, if you've got it, you should give it. Simple as that. If you've got it, you must give it. I hope he's not talking about evangelism. Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> well, well, here's the thing about sharing your faith. And maybe you found this to be true for yourself. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. It's true of many things in life, and it's certainly true here. The, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Now, um, in a normal year, the London Marathon would be just around the corner. Uh, it was due to be in April, of course, but uh, now it's been delayed due to the coronavirus. Now, if you're a normal human being, um, by which I mean a non-marathon runner, um, you will find the marathon both amazing and annoying. Perhaps you know what I mean. It's, it is amazing that so many people have been able to extend their fitness to be able to handle a run of 26.2 miles in one blast. That is amazing. And it's also annoying that some of them run it like this, um, as if the normal race is just too easy. Some of them run it backwards. Some people run it in scuba diving gear or dressed up as Big Ben. It is amazing, but it's annoying. <laughs> now, how is it that some people can accomplish that incredible feat? whether they're running forwards or backwards. Well, nobody gets out of bed one morning and just decides to go for a 26-mile jog, or at least very few people do that. The vast, vast, vast majority of people put in months of training in order to accomplish that. They use whatever strength they have, they get home, go to bed, and when they've rested and recovered, find that they are able to run further or faster than they could have done before. They stretch themselves to their capacity and then find that they have more. Through using what they have, they receive more. Do you see that? If you want greater strength, you have to use what you have in order to get it. If you want greater faith, then use what you have. Whoever has will be given more. And then the opposite, verse 25, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, like muscles that atrophy through lack of use, like enthusiasm that fades over time, like sight that dims, like faith that shrinks, like understanding that evaporates like dew on the grass. If you do nothing with what you have, even what you have will leave you. And so... If you have the seed, you must share the seed. If you've got the light, you must give the light. These things were designed to be shared. And more quickly, um, the second and third parables here, they build on this existing idea. They begin to tell us um, not just why we should scatter the seed, but how we should think about scattering the seed and what is actually going on when we do. Listen to this. Um, verse 26, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. We spoke about this a little bit um, two weeks ago. Uh, there is something fascinating about the power and potential that is contained within even the smallest of seeds. Uh, do you remember how we talked about uh, the way we often think the sower has more power than he actually does? Um, we end up obsessing over how we scatter the seed. Um, more training, uh, better techniques, more studies, more seminars, but the power doesn't lie with you, does it? It lies with the seed. What about the other extreme? Um, 
I'm fine, but the problem is this seed, it's not working. The soil doesn't seem to be agreeing with it. We sow, but we see so little fruit that sometimes we might be tempted to alter this thing, the seed, the word of God. We might be thinking, well, this bit's not going to fit well with our modern mindset. Let's get rid of that or minimize that. It would be nice if the Bible agreed with what the culture said on that particular issue. So let's twist it to say what we want it to. Let's do some sort of biblical origami so it reads the way we want it to. We end up sort of genetically modifying the seed so it suits its surroundings. And of course, once again, that drastically underestimates the power of the seed and all that is going on under the surface. We need to be crystal clear about what lies within our realm of responsibility and what is well outside of our responsibility. Planting seed, sharing light, our responsibility. Causing growth, uh, bringing life, not our responsibility. That can be hard for us to take. But uh, think of this. Think of the farmer, as we were thinking about in verses 26 to 29. He plants the seed and he goes to bed. He does not transfer the nutrients from the soil into the seed. He doesn't dig it up every day and check on it. He doesn't crack the shell open ever so slightly um, to help the seed to sprout. He doesn't get a pair of tiny tweezers and pull coils of thin, feeble roots out of the seed and plant them into the soil exactly where he wants them to go. Almost all this process is beyond his control and beyond his understanding. What does he do? He scatters and he sleeps. The part that we play in the saving of souls is humblingly small. And even that uh, is strength and grace that God gives to enable us to do that work. Life, um, transformation, growth, all these things happen, as it were, completely aside from the skills and strengths, input or ability of us or the farmer in this picture. What does he do? He scatters and then he sleeps. That is a picture of what you and I are called to do, isn't it? Scatter the seed and then sleep. Share the good news and trust God for the increase. Share the good news. Be absolutely persuaded then of your complete inability to force a response out of anyone. The only thing you can do once your small job is done is rest, which is an act of obedience and trust in God. Share the good news and see that you do and then rest. Now, of course, um, the truth is nothing happens outside of the the sovereignty of God, and so while you are unable to do anything, God is at work. And while you are asleep, God is awake. And while you have reached the end of your ability, all things are possible to God. The Christian who has understood this tiny little parable in verses 26 to 28, the Christian who has understood these four verses will be careful to faithfully share the seed, which is the word of God, and then will leave the matter of growth in the hands of God. Now that's hard, isn't it? It's hard to do that. It's hard if you've got loved ones who have not responded to the revelation of God. It's hard if you've got children who have not yet put their trust in Jesus. You've got ears to hear. You've got a heart of soft soil. You yourself have seen the light. You've responded to the gospel. You know that this is true. You have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, but they haven't, at least not yet. And so you pray for them desperately, and you think of them constantly, and you share your faith regularly, and you live your life purposefully, these verses tell you that is enough. Your next duty, once you've done those things, is, as it were, to spiritually sleep, rest, relax, trust that the God who saved you um, will save all those who are his. The God who is judge of all the world will do what is right. All things are completely and entirely and undeniably in his hands. So trust him like the farmer who goes to bed when the day is done. A couple of weeks ago, I was told of a woman who was staying with a friend, a member of the the church here, and when the weekend came around, um, this particular guest was brought along to church for a Sunday service here. When she was here, She, and these are my words, uh, not hers, she saw the light, as it were, of this 
community, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, a community of people who are letting their light shine before others. Um, this guest, she saw your good deeds. Um, she saw your, your kindness and your care and your warm welcome of her. The light was shone. Um, she, she heard the good news. That the seed was sown from this very pulpit. And then she went home. And that's the end of the story. I bet you thought it was going to end with a sort of dramatic conversion, but actually it hasn't, at least not yet, except to say um, that as a result of her weekend here, she decided that she would start going to church. And so she is now going to a a faithful, um, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, God-honoring church, and that is the end of the story as far as we know. But imagine with me for just a moment of what that might mean, what God might choose to do with even that small little seed that was scattered. Every week, um, for the foreseeable future, uh, the seed will be sown into her life. And who knows if one day, the seed might not just connect with soil that is ready to receive it, a heart that has been prepared to receive the good news of the gospel, a heart that is willing to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. If that happened, think of the difference that would make, not just to her eternal life, but also to her eternal legacy. Her household now has a Christian living in it. What happens if her husband, perhaps, becomes a Christian? What if her children are now being raised by at least one, but maybe two Christians? What if they um, grow up to serve in their church? Uh, What if they lead in Sunday school and serve Sunday school uh, and teach in the youth groups? What if these children, when they grow up, form Christian um, marriages and Christian households? Think of the workplaces that might be impacted by having at least one more Christian um, serving in those places, loving God in those places, shining the light of truth in those places. Think of these, these people who were once soil turning into sowers themselves, sowing seed for themselves. Think of the impact that could be just astronomical um, because of seed that was simply sown here one weekend. All the glory goes to God. We've never been more aware of how connected all of our lives are, have we? Uh, we are all connected with one another. Our lives impact each other, and those lives will go on to impact others. And this is what gospel growth looks like. One tiny little mustard seed sown in one corner of the kingdom might have effects in the other corner for an eternity to come. Listen to this. This is the mustard seed principle. This is what the uh, the growth of the gospel looks like. Verse 31. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. Something that seems so small may well go on to have a disproportionate, uh, supernatural, spiritual impact. This is just one story that made its way um, back to me, made its way back to us, and we don't know how that story ends. She's not become a Christian yet. But there are countless stories that will never come back to us, never reach us in this lifetime. If you are a Christian, if you are um, faithfully sowing the seed in word and in deed with whatever strength and ability you have, if you are shining the light to the best of your ability as you go through life, God is using that to change the word. If you are faithfully sowing the seed, if you are letting your light shine before men, you have no idea the impact that that might be making, the ways in which God might choose to use those things for his glory and by his grace. So let me close by saying this. Press on in the faith. Sow the seed as best you can with what you have today. And don't be motivated by the fruit that you see or discouraged at the fruit that you don't see. Be motivated by the faithfulness of God. Um, Don't be motivated by the produce that you get from your efforts. Be motivated by the promise of God, the one who is able to do more than you could ever ask or even imagine. And by his grace, he will. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for those who first sowed the seed into our lives. We thank you that you have made us good soil. We thank you that you've caused us to receive the good news and respond with joy. Lord, will you help us to to move from being just soil to being sowers of the seed, to being shiners of the light. Father, will you cause much fruit to be grown, whether we see it or not, whether we know it or not. We want heaven to be full to the glory of your praise. We want all people to know your goodness. So Lord, 
won't you use even us, imperfect people, to accomplish your perfect will? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.